please stay tuned to the end of this episode to listen to an interview done by Bill, who is a regular here at the Crack House. He is interviewing Michael Fauché, who is the owner of Fabic Customs. These guys are putting on a benefit car show slash craft fair to benefit a cancer patient. I will put a link to their Facebook page and website and all their social media accounts in the show notes for this episode. So be sure to check it out and listen at the end of this episode, like I said, and get all the details. Thanks. Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles. I am Donnie, your host, and with me is a man who shot his first turkey yesterday and scared everyone in the frozen food section. It is Dale. <laughs> what's up, bud? Oh, what's going on, man? Glad to be back and at it again. Oh, doing another episode, man. We're hitting these pretty good, trying to get our fans something to listen to, hopefully give them something that questions everything. Make some folks happy and get caught back up and back on a roll. We're ready to go. Absolutely. We want to get into this case this week? Or anything else you want to talk about before we get into this case? Uh, I think we just dive right in and see what happened to Miss Roberts here. All right. This is uh, the disappearance of Leah Roberts. Dale, this, this story here blows my mind, dude. It was on March 18th in 2000. Joggers along a road near the Baker Mountain Highway in What- Whatcom County. I have trouble saying that. Whatcom County, Washington. It's kind of like Walla Walla Walla. But. Yeah, but it was <laughs> Whatcom County, Washington. They reported seeing a wrecked vehicle at the bottom of an embankment near Canyon Creek. Now, this is a tributary of the North Fork of the Nooksack River. You got some names out there, don't oh, you? Oh, yeah. It's, it's some tongue. It's some tang tusters. That's for sure. Nooksack. All right. Now, investigating deputies found a white 1993 Jeep Cherokee with a North Carolina license plate. And they traced the car to Leah Roberts. All right, Dale. Leah Toby Roberts was born in 1976. She was the youngest of three children in a family living in the suburbs of Durham, North Carolina. Right. When she was 17, her father was diagnosed with a chronic lung illness. And this hit the family pretty hard. It was pretty devastating to them. And this put a great deal on the family as Leah began her studies at North Carolina State University in Raleigh in 1995. When Leah was 20 years old and a sophomore in college, now get this, Dale, her mother suddenly dies of heart disease. Mm. And I've read reports, too, that her mother knew about the heart disease but didn't tell anything about it. Right, she didn't want to put that on her kids. Anymore. Because they knew her she father. was already sick. Yeah, they, and she didn't want to put this on the family, and she suddenly died. And this, this blew their world. Yeah. All right. In the fall of 1998. This is three years later. Yep. She returned to school after taking some time off. And it was also then that she had to be hospitalized. Leah had to be hospitalized because she was in a serious car accident. Yeah, very. Yeah, and it resulted in a punctured lung and a shattered femur. And she actually thought she was dying. Yep. Yeah. Now, the surgeons, they inserted a metal rod next to the femur to help it heal. And uh, Leah also told her sister Kara later, when she saw the truck hit her. It was a semi-truck, too. Yeah, it it pulled out in front of her and hit her. She was certain mm-hmm. that she was going to die. And she felt born again after, after the, the recovery. Uh, again, she took some time off from college, and it was then that she decided she wanted to live her life to the fullest. Yeah, she's in stuff could go quick, so she was just going to go ahead and start living her life. You know, I, I can't imagine being in that situation, seeing your life flash before your eyes and... You know, I can I can get the part to live your life to the fullest right. and, and live making every day count. Yeah, just losing her mom and having that serious wreck almost take you out too. Make you think about. It. Yep. In the spring of 1999, it was just three weeks before she was scheduled to leave for Costa Rica. 
her father died. Right. Yeah. Mm. And despite this, Dale, Leah decided to continue with the field program. And since she was leaving the country and no longer had living parents, Leah granted her sister Kara power of attorney over her bank accounts. Um, I've never been over overseas for England at the time. Is that a pretty common thing to do? You've been overseas. Yeah, but I don't know about this, which I didn't have a lot of money neither, so... Yeah, but, so uh, she was, and I think she had received an inheritance from her parents dying yes. too. So it's probably a pretty significant amount of money. Yeah, probably that, and then well, both of her parents had passed away, so somebody needed to be in charge. Exactly. But anyway, she left power of attorney to her sister Kara over her bank accounts, where some money had been inherited from her parents, like we said. With her degree in Spanish and anthropology almost complete, and I think she liked six months graduating or yeah, something. Much, yeah. yeah, just a few credits. Uh, Leah dropped out of school. And her sister Kara and her brother Heath tried to persuade her to stay in school. Yeah, to stick it out. Yeah, stick it out. But she refused. She didn't want to stay in school. So in spite of her studies, she learned to play the guitar and even took up photography as a hobby. So it looked like she was sort of, I don't know, living life to the fullest. You know. Yeah, maybe after that trip to Costa Rica, she's kind of, I don't know, uh, hippie and out a little bit. Yeah. like a better term, you know, it's going to be just play guitar and just chill for a while. And she even got a pet kitten and named it B, B-E-A. I can't be, you know. Yeah, you can't be. Leah, <laughs> Andy. All right. <laughs> Leah began hanging out. A little Mayberry shout out. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. Leah began hanging out in local coffee shops, writing poetry about the meaning of life, and she was doing all this in her journals and making new friends in the progress. It's definitely hippie in that little bit. Oh, yeah. And one of them was a Janine Quiller. And with her roommate, Nicole Bennett, she discussed the idea of emulating a beat generation and uh, about the novelist Jack Kerouac. The beatniks. Yeah. And going on a road trip out west. Now, on the morning of March 9th, Leah talked on the phone with Kara about possible future plans. They made no commitments, but Kara recalls the call ending with the understanding they would meet in some fashion in the near future. Right. You know, just, you know, hey, see you later, I'll holler at you later type thing. You know? Sister talk. Yeah. But later in the afternoon, Leah and Nicole agreed to do some babysitting together the next day. Uh, Nicole went to her job and returned later, at which point she noticed that Leah's 1993 Jeep was not there at the house, nor was Leah. Well, she didn't think nothing about it, as you know, they, you know, roommates coming and going, you know, they pass each other and they don't see each other for a couple of days. Right. And, but. Especially with her having a job and Leah didn't, she was just so out doing whatever she does and the other girl was working. Yeah. But um, she thought nothing of it as Leah had been coming and going for un- unpredictable intervals and she dropped out of school and was living off her inheritance for a time. And really needed no, didn't need to report to a job or anything. No. I mean, she was just... Living a life. Oh, yeah, living a life off the inheritance and just doing her thing. Carefree. But the next day, Leah didn't show up for the babysitting appointment. And she had not returned home by the end of the day. And by the following day, at the end of the day, on March 11th, Leah still hadn't showed up. But family and friends who had expected to see her had been calling the house trying to find her. Yeah, it's like she ditched some plans or something and just hadn't showed up and nobody had heard anything from her. Yep. On March the 13th, this was a Monday, Kara reported her missing to the Durham police. This was her roommate. No, I'm it's sorry, this sister. is her sister. Yes. Kara was her sister. She reported to the, the Durham police. Yeah, I think the roommate had actually had called her sister and see if uh, they had heard from her the last couple of days and uh, they had not heard or seen her either. And they began... Calling all friends and anybody they could think of to call, and nobody had seen her, and then they went ahead and reported her missing after that. Yep. Now, the next day on March 14th, Kara and Leah's roommate, Nicole, searched Leah's room, and a significant amount of clothing were missing. Right. Uh, suggesting a, up. Yeah, suggesting a planned, lengthy absence. And she seemed to be taking her cat, B, with her. She also left a note that said, I'm not suicidal. I'm the opposite. Yeah. First time I read that, I was like, wow. Yeah. So she's just, she's wanting to live life. She's yeah. wanting just to. Just go. Yep. 
which you know sort of reassured her sister and friends and mentioned she also mentioned uh, Kerouac she was all into that guy wasn't she yeah she was and this is going to play into the story a little bit more later on but she was into Jack Kerouac pretty pretty heavy along with the note she had some bundled cash and it was approximately a month's worth of her share of the rent and other expenses I guess the house they were staying in yeah I think it's about $500 yeah and suggested she would be returning eventually. Now, this note had an illustration on it she drew, and it was a drawing of the Cheshire Cat. I'm glad you said that. Cheshire. Yeah, that gets me every time. Yeah, Cheshire. I think I put that on stakes when I was... <laughs> no. Yeah. Worse with Cheshire? Yeah, Cheshire. It's the Cheshire Cat's grin. If anybody knows that, that's from the Alice in Wonderland. Oh, right. The cat that can disappear and reappear and they actually thought this might be some kind of sign from Leah you know I'm gonna take some time off and it's gonna go away and then I'll pop back up yep just like the like Cheshire the cat, cat. Um, since Kara still had no power well since Kara still had power of attorney over Leah bank account she was able to look at Leah's records and you know see what was going on see if she'd done anything and she had discovered that Leah had withdrawn several thousands of dollars on the afternoon of March 9th. Yeah, three grand, I believe, it was the approximate number. Yeah. And then used her debit card to pay for a motel room near Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah, so she just hit I 40 and hit it out. Yeah. So, and later transactions were a purchase of gas or food, and their location suggested that Leah was traveling west along 40 and then moved north on Interstate 5. And when she reached I-40's western end in California. After a gas purchase shortly after midnight on the morning of March 13th in Brooks, Oregon, all activity on Leah's bank account ended. It came to a stop. She wasn't doing anything else. And to sort of figure this out, Kara headed to the Pacific Northwest with Susie Smith, which was Leah's best friend. Right. And they went to coffee shops in Durham, which they've been frequenting, you know. They they found that this Janine Quiller, with whom she had talked about Kerouac's work, you know, it's, like I said, this is coming back into play. The two had been particularly struck by the 1958 novel by Jack called The Dharma Bums, and it's a sequel to a better known novel by him called On the Road, in which he had, you know, he worked for time for the U.S. Forestry Service as a fire lookout on Desolation Peak in the northern Cascade Mountains of Washington. And he was profoundly affected by the beauty of this area, Dale. I mean, he, you know, him, him describing it is just like God's country, right. pretty much. You know, and Leah, <clears throat> she expressed interest in seeing this area for herself. She she was following in the footsteps of Jack Kerouac. She was all about him. Yeah. And she was relieved to discover that her sister's probable objective you know, this is what she was doing. Yeah, they think you got her tracked down now. Yeah, Leah's account showed no activity, but she had no reason to believe something unfortunate had occurred. Oh, no, she had all that money, so she didn't really have to use her debit card, you'd think. True, that's true. Now, we get into March 18th. Kara expected Leah would call her on this day because that was her birthday, yep. her 26th birthday. And instead on that day, Kara got a note. It was actually stuck in the mail slot of her house and it was from the Durham County Sheriff's Office telling her to call the counterparts in Whatcom County, Washington. Very good. Mm -hmm. I, I said that well. Yeah, I was going to tell you to put a dot in the middle, you can say what.com would be yeah, easier, but, it's, but you got it. That's it's just Whatcom, <laughs> Whatcom County and that's in uh, it's Bellingham, Washington. She then learned that earlier that day, Leah's Jeep had been discovered in the remote forest but Leah was not present. This is down that ravine. That couple, jogging couple, found it. Down in the bottom. Yep. Yep. This, you know, it was like I say, it was on Canyon Creek Road alongside the, the Mount Baker Highway. All right. From the path the car took through the trees and the extent to which, you know, there was damage, investigators determined that the vehicle had been, the most that we could travel in is, a, is about 40 miles an hour, Dale. They're, they're estimating 30 to 40 mm. when it went off the road and down the slope. And contents were tossed everywhere. It looked like the car took a multiple rollover. Yeah. 
Yeah, there was no blood, no signs of injury to anyone or nothing like that. The seat belt hadn't been stretched. Uh, it did, it really doesn't look like anybody was in the vehicle. Yeah, it's pretty strange. The yeah. windows busted out from flipping down the hill, but it doesn't look like anyone was inside. No, it was just debris everywhere. And when they discovered the vehicle, they found blankets and pillows were hung outside the windows, suggesting that somebody had been using this as a shelter after it had been wrecked. Now, they also found Leah's passport, checkbook, driver's license, a lot of her clothes. Her guitar. Yep. CDs and other stuff belonging to her scattered everywhere. Bits of cat food, a, a lot of stuff. Nope, the, they didn't find the cat. They found the cat carrier with no cat. Yep. However, valuables such as $2,500 in cash and pants pockets and jewelry were also left behind. So you'd think, to me, if somebody had been using this as a shelter, they would have found the cash. Yeah, because pretty much that's. If she took out three grand and she left five, that's pretty much all it is, unless she had another stash. Unless she had, you know, like carrying around cash yeah. that she used. So she hadn't spent a lot of money, and so most of it's still there. Yeah. All right. Especially if you track all the way across the country. Mm hmm. That's right. All right. Kara and her brother Heath flew to Bellingham to assist in the investigation. They visited the crash site, and with the assistance of the sheriff's office, create a flyer which they posted all over town they they pretty much papered the town Dale. and they went into businesses that leah may have visited you know in that area that you know stuff that she might like and among leah's belongings they found a box of mementos from this trip i guess she was putting little things in there receipts and whatnots and right. different things now inside this memory box was a movie ticket stub and it was for the movie American Beauty. Yep, from uh, March 13th, actually. Yep. And it was from the Bellingham's Bells, Bellis Fair shopping mall. And this, you know, suggested that she may have spent a few hours in the city after arriving and just hung out. You know, she was going to go to the movie and just hang out around town. Now, near the restaurant was the mall's only sit-down restaurant. And Heath and Kara believed that, you know, knowing Leah... She might have gone in to eat. Right. And police were led to two customers, both men, who not only recalled Leah, but had sat down with her at the restaurant counter that day. Yeah, they said this restaurant really uh, looked like the one she always hung out with in, uh, in Durham. So they figured that definitely would draw her there. But plus being the only sit-down restaurant, she didn't have a whole lot of choice, I guess. But from everything I gathered, Dale, she sat at the counter to eat. Right. Yeah. Yes. She didn't actually like sit. Like a bar. Yeah. And one of the men claimed that she had left with a third, whom she called Barry. Right. And provided a description for the police and even a sketch of the man. However, neither the other man nor the other customer who had been in the restaurant at the time could corroborate the third man's existence. Right. So only this one guy that knew of this Barry that she supposedly left with. Everybody else said she left by herself. Yeah, so it, it's almost like they're... They're putting the blame out there on somebody else. On uh, Barry. Yeah, to take it, take the the heat off of them. At the police garage where the car had been towed, investigators continued to examine the Jeep. They had been joined by the FBI, and they became involved due to Liz having crossed state lines. You know, I've said this before. Anytime I somebody cross state lines, that's when the FBI, they get involved. Right. All right. There were two aspects of the evidence they developed suggested to them that Leah had been a victim of a crime. First, the amount of money in her pants suggested that she had spent very little time in Bellingham. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Also, they found under the floor mat was Leah's mother mother's engagement ring. Yeah. Which yeah. Was, her, was her... Pretty much prized possession. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> you know, that. <laughs> she, everything I've read, Dale, she wouldn't take it off. No, never, never. This I was... go anywhere without it. Yeah, I mean, she even showered with this ring on. It was... Yeah. This was her mother's engagement ring, and it was... It, was her everything to yeah, her. It was her connection to her mom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they found this under the floor mat in her vehicle. And, you know, which gets me, you know, if somebody had been staying in the car, would have found a ring. They would have been yeah. pawn shop money right there. Yeah, it's just, I don't, I don't believe anybody was in that car. No, I don't, I don't think so either. It's pretty, pretty strange. Yeah. 
Heath and Kara, they returned to North Carolina after about four days, and they were working on a theory that she might have been injured in an accident and wandered off. Uh, police sent two, spent two weeks in April searching with the help of dogs and helicopters around the area where the Jeep had been found, you know, trying some kind of to find something that she had left at the scene, you know, anything. Yeah, well, you'd think if it's ever when you was, there'd be some blood if she was in there, if she had head trauma or something, you know. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but there was nothing, no, no trace of her dog. <clears throat> uh, security camera footage from a gas station. Back in Oregon. Yeah. It's shown her alone and apparently in good condition. And I've seen this uh, this video online. Oh, yeah? And she's at the counter. She's got a, a hat on. Looks like a, a hat with a brim type hat. Hippie hat. Yeah, kind of, you know, walking right at the counter, looking around. But the video shows her glancing out the window, out to the parking lot or the gas pumps or something, turning back her head back and forth several times. So I don't know. I don't know what she was looking at. So there's no sound to the video. Right? No, and there's no camera in the, in the parking lot. No, it just shows her looking out that way. So it could have been anything. She could have been looking at somebody, or she could have just been heard something outside and glancing at her. Could have been. been anything. I got you. Yeah. But, you know, it, as far as the video goes, it shows her in very good condition. And while the transaction was completed, you know, they suggest that she didn't have a traveling companion. There was nobody with her. There was no Barry. There was no Barry. A few days after the Jeep was discovered, a man called the sheriff's office to report a sighting of Leah. His wife, he claimed, had seen her disoriented and confused wandering around a gas station in Everett. And this is close, it's like a suburb of Seattle. Yeah, it's kind of where my daughter was living and when they were in the military. Okay. After passing this information along, he seemed to panic and hung up before identifying himself. This is very, very odd to me. Yeah, very strange. If he's going to help, what would, what would get him? But, you know, nevertheless, the police consider this this tip credible. I wonder if they recorded it. I'd like to hear that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I've never, I didn't even checked into that, but it would be interesting to find out about that. Mm-hmm. Recording what's called. Some was said spooked him, uh, apparently. Mm-hmm. In 2001, the TV series Unsolved Mysteries, uh, which was airing, you know, Lifetime at the time, ran a segment of the case, and it generated some new tips to investigators and reports that she had been cited elsewhere in the U.S., but not provide, you know, didn't prove anything credible. Right. And there was definitely no financial records anywhere else. Yeah. So. All right. Now, back in North Carolina, Kara got in touch with. Monica Kason. A, she was a Wilmington woman who had helped other families find missing loved ones after cases had gone officially cold. And Kason has specialized in keeping cases alive in the media with the help of a network of volunteers called the Community United Effort. After you know efforts exhausted all leads, in 2005, on the fourth anniversary of Leah's disappearance, Kason organized a caravan across the country following Leah's route to Bellingham to raise awareness about her case, in particular in other solved missing person cases. So you know, this, this pretty much become an annual event for them. Right. They do this every year. Now getting back to Leah's vehicle, it Kara they had asked Kara if she wanted the vehicle, you know, and she suggested to the uh, police officers that they keep it because you know I guess her being a I don't know if she was into crime or whatever, but you know she was thinking ahead definitely. Oh, definitely thinking ahead. Uh, told them to keep it. Maybe they'll find something later. Right. You know, instead, okay. of, instead of selling it or taking it for scrap, whatever, just just hold on to it because you never know when what's going to pop up. The technology new, can new, improve exactly. and stuff. So yes. they kept the vehicle. They they kept it impounded for almost six years. And this case, the the detective that was on the case at the time retired. Right. And he turned all of his stuff over to a new officer, and they decided to check the vehicle again. And he got to thinking nobody had looked under the hood. Which is crazy. <laughs> Blows my mind. Yeah, no, but they had checked the interior of the car, but never checked under the hood. So he checked under the hood, and when they pried it open, they found that a wire to a starter relay had been cut. Which, I don't, I'm not a mechanic, and I don't know how things work under a hood like that. But they said this would allow the car to accelerate without anyone pressing the gas pedal. Mm. So, you know, this confirmed early suspicions that no one had been in the car when it left the road and had been purposely wrecked. They also found a fingerprint under the hood and found some male DNA on an article of Leah's clothing. Yeah, so it's getting a little 
The plot thickens, as they say. Yeah. And this led them back to the man who claimed that, you know, Leah left Bella's Fair restaurant with a third man she called Barry, uh, whom only the second man had reported seeing. Right. Yeah. That man had worked as a mechanic and had military background. So that's kind of fishy right there. Right. The guy that made up the Barry had to... He had the skills. Yeah, how would he? You know, how would he know to clip a wire on a, a relay to make a car go? Yeah, I don't. I don't even know. All I know how to make a car go if I'm not to put a brick on the gas pedal. Right. But yeah, he he knew enough. Somebody knew enough to do something to a relay to make a car go. Correct. It didn't just happen. No. But this guy, he moved to Canada, and this complicated efforts tremendously now I heard from another source that he actually lived in Canada and he was in the United States for a short time doing some stuff and maybe with uh, with work or something and then he went back to Canada yeah so moved return same difference but we got to remember this this area of the country is right near Canada right I mean it ain't far so it's not uncommon for people to go back and forth yeah correct you know, it's it's not at all. So it made me just kind of sound like he was running when he moved to Canada, but if he already lived there, he was just going back home. Yeah. That's kind of what I'm saying. So the they had it set up where they would get try to get some DNA and fingerprints from this guy. Right. But um, every, it, and it took almost two years to get this. I don't know, legal, I don't know, I don't know why that took two years. But it depends on who you ask. He said he... Uh, he agreed right away. They said he was kind of dodging them, but I don't know if it took him two years to ask him, but it took two years regardless. So. Mm-hmm. But none of the DNA or fingerprints matched him. So it didn't matter anyway. And it didn't matter anyway. All right. Now, getting back to Leah, she had that steel rod in her leg. You know, so if something happened to her, if somebody killed her and disposed of the body you know stuff is going to decompose right that steel rod's not going anywhere right it's always going to be there it's always going to be there and i don't know if you know they knew she had a steel rod in her leg probably not it's not something he's running around telling everybody now, hey i got a steel rod in my leg <laughs> by the way <laughs> yeah they're not going to think about it it could be somebody could find out with a metal detector one day yeah which there was one found dale oh yeah yeah and they matched the lot number to the one they found and it happened to be the same lot number it was shipped the same time the one leah had so it came about about the same time she had her surgery so it's possible that it could be could be her it could be what i mean what are the odds of a femur steel rod two being shipped at the same time it was kind of found in the same area too right it was she went missing yeah but the i don't know if they found dna on it or what but it came back as a male dna Hmm. so yeah maybe that wasn't there yeah stuff like that can be misinterpreted yeah especially that long i don't know being in elements yeah yeah, in 2014, a mummified body was found in the same region where she uh, disappeared. Uh, the body was unrecognizable, but apparently classified as a white male between 33 and 55, which is a little bit older than she would have been. However, massive mistakes have been made before on badly decayed bodies, so it could be, you know... Uh, when you say mummified, it's just bone? Yeah, pretty, yeah, probably bone and maybe dried up flesh yeah stuff mm-hmm. but you know sometimes genders is not uh it's not correct when they uh try to guess at that but in any case this doe was estimated about five foot five which is the same height and also had a metal rod implanted in the right femur the rod's lot number was traced and the batch was apparently shipped in the fall of 1998 at the time when leah roberts had her surgery now it seems likely or extremely unlikely chance that the body at the same height turns up in the same area with a metal rod from the same lot in the same leg so how tall was Leah? she was like what five 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 foot five hundred thirty pounds so some dude 30 to 40 years old five five that's uh, kind of in the same area in the same leg with the same lot number uh rod yeah it's pretty coincidental yeah i don't it's kind of far-fetched but it's a whole lot of coincidental. I mean, it is. It's like three or four 
things that are the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I'm almost thinking this this could be her in a way. I think so too. It's and they just got the I mean, come on. the gender mixed up. Right. It's probably not a lot left. It's been what almost 20 years, right? Mm-hmm. Well, when was this family? When did I say? Uh, 2014. So five years ago. So. It was 15 years. Oh, I'm sure they still got DNA on this. They could, they could, they could they, test it again. Yeah, they definitely could check that. I yeah. Know. I would love to find out more on that and see, you know, if they ever done anything more with that. All right, Dale, you got any more on this? Now, that's about all that we could find. Um, so, you know, it's a really sad. It's another sad story of disappearance with a, kind of a North, North, North Carolina start going across the country and... And she yep. gets to watch it. Nobody knows what happened. I think uh, I had never heard of this case. You mentioned you brought it to me, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and we got to diving into it. And I was like, wow. Yeah. You know, I, I was like wondering why I've never heard of this case, but it's very intriguing. I've I've went down some rabbit holes on it, digging different things, but her disappearance is pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty wild. I mean, I don't know. You just she gets out there, and then everything just disappears. And then you find her car. In her pretty uh, weird circumstances, I, I just don't buy that she drove that car off that hill and hit her head and wandered off and died. Yeah, um, and left all her money, left her mother, her mother's ring that she never took off. So mm-hmm. why would it be in the floorboard? I mean, it didn't hit her hard enough to knock a ring off, put her in the floorboard. I mean, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just and then the, of course the wire was cut under the hood. There's a whole lot of suspicious stuff going on here, and I think. Uh, somebody had done something with this girl i think she met the well, maybe it could have been the guy at the restaurant but she was uh, eager to pop up and, and sit down and tell everybody that she was going on a, a trip to find herself and she was by herself and she wanted to go do this stuff and i think somebody somebody got her yeah following jack kerouac's footsteps that's uh, for sure yeah that's what she wanted to do she got whacked i think but, uh, you know, give us your thoughts, comments, suggestions. What do you think happened to Leah Roberts? We would love to hear what you guys think about it. Anything else, Dale? No. Let's, uh, let's see if we can do some more research on that on that, that, uh, that steel rod. See if we can think of anything else. If we do, we'll drop it on the Facebook page. Yep. And we're going to post pictures on our social media of the car, um, of Leah, different things, and keep you guys in loop what's going on with her. And uh, the letter also, the Cheshire Cat. Cheshire Cat. And not a picture of my steak with uh, Cheshire <laughs> sauce on it. Oh, yeah. All right, guys. We're going to get out of here. Um, Thanks like, for listening. Appreciate you all very, very much. The downloads are looking really good, and we can't thank you enough. Absolutely. We appreciate all of our listeners. We want everyone to be safe. Please be careful out there, and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is the The Crack Crack House Chronicles. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Bill from the Crack House Chronicles. I haven't been around a while. I've been doing a little freelance and stuff. But I made a special appearance and I come over here to a a good friend of ours, somebody we've we've met before, and uh, Michael Fauché from Fabric Fabric Customs, Double Shoals Cotton Mill. Cotton Mill, Double Shoals Cotton Mill. I got to get this stuff right. Because we just refer to it as a meal a lot of times. But I'm going to tell you something. This guy's got it going on. He's got the fa- he's got the fab shop. He builds cars. He's he's working on this event space. He's a promoter. I like to think he's an entrepreneur. He's got a lot of things going on for Cleveland County right now. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this as a throw out to y'all. If you in the sound of my voice in Cleveland County, because I know the Crack House Chronicles is worldwide right now. Donnie posts all the time about how we getting all over the world. We got people listening, which is a great thing. But today's show is about Cleveland County. Now, what I'm tra- what I was trying to get at is Cleveland County has got some diamonds and gems laying around, and some of y'all may not know about it. So that's why we're doing this. Michael over here has got it going on. He's got. My band is played here. We've got bands that are getting their first shot out play here. We got established bands playing here. The man is trying to do something for the county, and if he wants to go into it, he can go into it. But he's told me some of his plans and his dreams and ideas, and I'm telling you, if you don't get out and support this man and you cry about there ain't nothing to do in Cleveland County, it's your fault. So, with that, <laughs> I know Mike's over here going, man, you're just laying on thick. <laughs> Anyways, welcome, Michael. How's it going today? Oh, it is going wonderful. It's another great day. It's 
the, the weather's cooled down. We got a little rain. It's just, you, you rode up here on your motorcycle. Oh, yeah. It's just, it's a beautiful day. It's, Any it's, day's a good day. It is. It's just wonderful. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's great. So, what's some of the projects that are on the front burner right now? What's, what's hot and heavy and needs to be worked on most? Oh, yeah, we just got all kind of stuff going on. But uh, w one thing, I don't know if it's hot and heavy. Well, it's maybe hot and heavy because we're trying to get this thing all uh, settled. Get my words out here right. But uh, so we're jumping into this e-bike market. And, and if you don't know, I'm just a little bit e-bike. E stands for electric. So I don't know. Just think of it like a little. Um, some of these things are small, like a little tiny. Uh, moped, uh, little mini bike things, and, so, and some of these things get a little bit bigger. Uh, we're building something frame size of about a, a 125 Honda, yeah. little dirt bike kind of thing. Kind uh, of an old school look, too. Yeah. Like the 70s street. Well, you we're trying to get this cafe bracer yeah, kind of look uh, going, too. But, you know, depending on what kind of handlebars, you could you set up something a little bit, a, a little different style. So, Trying to get a mixture, a middle ground, so you can just change out some tanks, change the handlebars. But we're putting a swing arm on, on the back. I'm sure there's somebody else out there making one with a swing arm. I've been looking a little bit. I don't see a lot. Most of them just hardtail things. I've got one out here I'm riding around that's hardtail. It beats me to death. <laughs> so I'm excited about putting this thing with a swing arm. So anyway, we're dealing with a, a another local uh, company, not a... Not Cleveland County local, but they're just over at the, uh, like, Davidson area. And uh, most of these things are built overseas. We're going to be building the frames here, right here in Cleveland County, building these frames. That's what like and then they're going to be assembled over here in Davidson. We might even assemble them here, for all I know. But uh, keep an eye out. Go to uh, Fabric Customs. Go to either our uh, Facebook page or Instagram. And uh, just follow along and see how that goes. We hope to have a, a working model by the end of November. Yeah, and I tell you, man, if you if you're not following right now, they keep he keeps it updated daily. There's some always some good content coming out on Instagram. Instagram is probably my favorite platform right now. I love Instagram, and and he keeps it hopping on the on the feed every day. Um, so let's uh, what about some back burner plans? I know we talked before. Anything you want to talk about on that front? Uh, like the building as a whole, you mean? Eh, well, yeah, but I was, I was, you know, I'm, I'm in the music part, but yeah, how, how's the building coming along? It's just slow. I don't know that I have anything new to report from the last time. Um, I'm a, I'm just trying to build up some money to do a couple things. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to sell some property. If you know anybody looking to buy <laughs> an automotive, I'm just going to plaster this, this thing all up with, with plugs. Uh, I'm trying to sell some property in Cherville. I got a four bay automotive shop on three acres of land. Okay. Um, $175,000. Okay. So, anybody uh, out there looking, you know where to come. Yes. Uh, but yeah, that's the main thing. I ain't got a whole bunch that's new cool. going on. Um, all right. Well, here at the Crack House Chronicles, we like a couple things. A, we like a murder mystery. We like a, uh, like all kinds of stuff like that but I tell you one thing we do like we like local and we like helping other people out when they can so uh, the, the main reason I come over here today is uh, to catch up with Mike and uh, see some projects and man he's got some great projects going on now they have craft fairs they have uh, uh, they have the Sarah Sweep there, there's a lot of things going on but right now Mike's wanting to pr promote something that's coming up in uh, November. A weeks. Yeah, November. Okay, it's a benefit car show and craft fair, Saturday, November second, nine a.m. to two p.m. Uh, and just once again, it's at one ninety nine Old Mill Road, Shelby, Double Shoals Mill at gmail dot com. If you want to get in touch with them, and free admission. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, we love free stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, the, so was this to help out? This is to help out a, a local young lady. Uh, if I'm not, she's like 20. 
I could have her age wrong, and and please forgive me if I do, but it's right there. It's she actually lives just right here in the Mill Village. Um, right here is just like two pieces of property away from the mill. Uh, basically, she um, she got cancer in her foot, and she had to have it amputated. Mm. So she's working with a prosthetic, and I mean, this is a young, active person. I mean, mm-hmm. imagine mobility. So th- this is to benefit her. We're we are donating the space completely. We're not charging anything for this. Uh, show all the proceeds that come in they're selling um the promoters the spaces if you want to come show your car that's uh i think it's 25 bucks uh but 100 percent of the proceeds are going to her and um it, it's 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 a nice local cause come out enjoy the property uh look at some cars and we're gonna have some craft vendors we're gonna have if you've ever been to one of our craft fairs it's that but miniature uh, probably about a third, about a, about a third of the craft vendors, uh, but a whole bunch of cars out here to look at. So it should be fun. I'm, I'm sure donations will be accepted. If you well, want to get obviously, some. yes. Yeah. You, have don- you can donate to this cause. You could donate to um, the mill itself. If, uh, give to this benefit first. But if you want to give a little bit extra and you want to give to us, we'd we'd appreciate everything that that's given to us. That sounds great, man. I mean, like I say, we we. We like support people. I like support Mike because he, you know, he does stuff, and I know some of the plans he's got, and and I think are great. And I think once we once he gets this thing going, we're gonna have some really cool to talk about around Cleveland County. But uh, we need y'all's help. He needs your help. Support out here. This young lady needs your help. Um, come on out and give some. And uh, just a little plug for us. Tell me you heard on Crack House Chronicles, and uh, maybe it'll be something for you. We don't know. Maybe we'll get you a stick or something. Something. We'll, we'll have to talk to Donnie about that. He he's a CEO. I'm just a I'm just a freelance uh, thug. Comes out here and hassles Mike about his cars and stuff. But uh, I tell you what, uh, I guess we're gonna go here. Yeah, I'm getting tongue tied all of a sudden. We're gonna go ahead and get out of here. Is there anything else you want to talk about, Mike? I think that covers most of it. I hope you come back. I always have something to talk about. You know me. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm a talker. So please come out. Come back again, and we'll uh, we'll find something else to talk about. All right, man. Well, good talking to you. We're signing off. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>